Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Children and Families uh, Decision Meeting. Uh, let's introduce everybody. I'm Councillor Rob Wood, the Cabinet Member for Children and Families. I'm Anna Martin, Democratic Services Officer. And I'm Alison Jeffrey, Director of Children, Families and Education. Okay, just some housekeeping information. Um, if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by these stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble at Queen Victoria's statue in front of the civic offices. In order to comply with Guildhall Trust Fire Marshal regulations, please remember to sign out when you leave the building after today's meeting. Uh, just draw your attention, we are being live streamed, so if you don't want to be filmed and you're a member of the public, which the vast numbers here, <laughs> uh, please say so. Okay. Um, everyone, please remember to use your microphones and uh, bear in mind we are out there on the web. Okay, so declarations. Sorry, apologies, first of all. I haven't received any apologies. Okay. I haven't received any apologies for absence. Okay. Okay, declarations of interest. Can I lodge my normal declarations if they're written down somewhere? Yeah, okay. So I'm happy if, if we can carry those declarations forward. Any other declarations? No? So we go straight on to item one, the Portsmouth Safeguarding Children Partnership Arrangements. Um, obviously, do you want to say anything further of them? I've read them through and I'm happy. Yeah. That's uh, that's great. The, the the purpose of the report is simply to seek your uh, approval for these new uh, partnership arrangements for safeguarding children. As the report says, the the arrangements have already been approved by the Portsmouth Clinical Commissioning Group and by Hampshire Police. Um, and the paper just gives background and uh, a bit about the expectations of the new legislation um, and the response in Portsmouth. Um, there's three particular changes uh, worth highlighting for anybody who's watching this and of interest. Um, the creation of a more formal executive at the Hampshire level for Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Portsmouth and Southampton coming together um, and shifting from an independent chair model to an independent chair and scrutineer model and sharing that post with uh, Southampton and uh, the post has been advertised and, and filled by Derek Benson. And thirdly, adopting a, a model of topic-based scrutiny uh, that we will be building on our existing multi-agency auditing to, to strengthen the way in which we can hold the mirror up to local practice. So those are the three key changes from uh, previous arrangements. Um, in the light of discussions we've had with you, Councillor, um, we've made changes, for example, the inclusion of the Society of St. James in the okay. list of named partners, um, which is a really helpful thing to do. Um, so, yeah, that, that's all I think I need to say by way of introduction. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm extremely sorry, my watch has stopped at quarter to four. Okay, mm -hmm. colleagues, if you could just introduce yourselves for the sake of the live streaming. Yes, yeah, Councillor Matt Atkins, the Conservative Group spokesman. Judith Spyth, Councillor St Jude Ward. And members, have you got any declarations of interests? Uh, no declarations. No. In your absence, uh, we've just run through item number three of the Portsmouth Safeguarding Children Partnerships. I've got nothing further to add. It's been outlined, and I hope you've you've read it. It's not a it's not a big talking point. Has anybody got any questions, or can I go straight on to the recommendations? Go ahead. There is one point I should draw your attention to. Um, it's a very small amendment that's been made to Appendix 1 of the arrangements compared to the published version. Um, the published version referred to um, the Sustainable Transformation Partnership for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, the new version refers to the Integrated Care System. Um, it effectively means the NHS operating at that uh, geography, but the Integrated Care System is actually the correct title for the structure that's being referenced there. So that change has been made to Appendix 1. Otherwise, it's, uh, obvious, there's obviously no change from published arrangements. Okay, colleagues, as I said, uh, unless you've got any specific, hopefully you've read it, you've got any specific mm. questions. We've um, obviously done this one quite a lot, and uh, it's been through the Health and Wellbeing Board. Judith, you've got a question? 
Um, I, I had one or two um, small questions. I couldn't understand uh, uh, the key principles on page 12. Uh, effective safeguarding may on occasion require action beyond usual institutional and agency constraints and boundaries. It does seem to me that, well, as we've already said in this document, that all agencies and indeed all individuals are responsible for the safeguarding of children, that that kind of seemed to me a sort of odd thing to say. Um, and there are one or two um, other small things that I may sort of take up when it's next come up comes up for revision. Um, for example, on page uh, 11, there's a um, middle of it. Um, senior officers have delegated authority to speak on behalf of the safeguarding partner. That's really important, and I'm really glad to see that in here. But they, it doesn't say that they... It, then it goes on to say, quite rightly, that they hold their own organisations or agency to account on how effectively they participate and implement the local arrangements. I actually think they're required to do that, not just to have authority about it. It's just... There are one or two things like that that don't give it quite the firmness that one might want if it was ever challenged in a court of law. Go ahead, um, go ahead Yeah, I, I think in terms of the, uh, the the first point you made about um, not needing to say that uh, it, they, right, that safeguarding yeah. may need to go to boundaries, I think the point there is just to underline the fact. Yeah. It's to really strengthen it. To Obviously, this is everybody's business yeah. and everybody is obliged to act. We're just really underlining that you can't say um, that because you did what you were expected to do within your own agency constraints, um, that's sufficient. Um, and this is a difficult one. And obviously, whenever we have serious case mm. reviews, these mm. things are, are looked at very closely. But we're really just saying to people, sometimes you need to step into public space beyond your mm. you know, expected remit in order to take yes. that action. So it's a, it's a reinforcing. Um, and the, the point of... On that point, I thought it actually just did the opposite, because that's exactly what it should be saying. If, it's just, if you'd said it like you did there, it's perfect. But it looks like it's... It, anyway, I don't think it's material, but I just wanted to... Um, I we, we will keep testing people's understanding of that point to make sure it's clear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if we can put that in the minutes, and Alison and I am all for tightening up anything that looks like we should be doing safeguarding, so it's worth... Following that through, thank you, well, Councillor. Uh, authority. It's one thing having authority; it's another thing exercising it. That's true. I think it's because um, under statute uh, there are these named people who are the statutory partners, um, and what we're saying is that their responsibility is being uh, delegated uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis to these named people who have that authority. Um, absolutely, the, the requirement to act is always there. And in fact, in the case of myself as uh, statutory director of children's services, those requirements are set down in legislation as they are for the lead member. Indeed, and that's, that comes through this document. Um, I mean, it's a particularly important thing as the PC G, for example, um, the PCT rather, is is an, a commissioning authority. It doesn't itself meet children and young people very often. And sometimes commissioners are unwilling to really get down alongside the very many providers that meet children to um, change their practice when it needs to be changed. I, yes, I mean, I, I'm sure... Um, the government thought very carefully about this in the in the legislation because it's on the face of the legislation which are the you know who, the description of the named partners and they need to name a partner in the NHS um, and as you know the NHS has um, many different uh, trusts and organisations within it and I think the view was taken that the clinical commissioning group as the, the the commissioning authority was the best place to put that responsibility but we have named in our arrangements all the local NHS provider organisations and indeed voluntary sector organisations which provide NHS services like the Society of St James um, so by being named in the arrangements they are equally um, accountable for the delivery of safeguarding in the area. Yes, I was impressed to see that list. I think that's a, a strength of the document. Um, but I, I think it, it just shows how very careful we've got to be with the wording of some of these things. And uh, um, 
I mean, we, because actually the, the CCG commissions nearly everything to do with children, but not everything it, that's in the health sphere. But they still NHS England uh, commission some, and they're very difficult to pin down if there are problems. So the legislation itself is 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 could be clearer too. Thank you, Judith. No, I was quite happy with the report. Thank you. Okay, I think I, I think in summary, I, I'm equally happy for as we go along to tighten things up so how would that happen so we're going to put it in the minutes and this is a hopefully a living document as opposed to a static document if you want to sound to me so how is it modified say as we go along we need to modify it just so we understand how that process happens I guess since the approval has been here formally by you, Councillor, if we want to change the text of the document, we would need to bring it to another formal decision-making meeting. I think the, perhaps one way forward is just to um, make sure that people understand the intent of it whenever we're talking through it and giving training on it, which I, I think they do. Um, and probably the the readership of the fine print may be relatively small but we have on our website the Portsmouth Ch Safeguarding Children Board website you know very much uh, all, all the detail and information that people would want about safeguarding arrangements in Portsmouth so okay and, and so therefore let's bet it in see how it goes as it comes and make a note in the minutes of those points you, you've made and then down the line uh, let's do a softer re review to see if we need to do a formalized review if there are lots of bits of feedback on it. Um, but I I'm also of the opinion that it should be a living document, which is we should review things at a reasonable level just to reflect practice rather than let it die on the vine type thing. Uh, absolutely, Councillor, and, and by saying that the readership would be small, I'm not um, in any way suggesting that we won't be um, either making it very clear or drawing out the salient points in all our training and communications. Okay, then I'll move it to the recommended. It's recommended that the Cabinet member approves the new strategic uh, safeguarding children partnership arrangements on behalf of the City Council, ready for publishing. Um, the arrangements have been approved already by the Portsmouth Clinical Commissioning Group and by Hampshire Police. So uh, I formally said the words and so it's, it's approved. Can we move on to item number four, creation of the new foster care ad uh, adaption policy? Yes, of course, Councillor. So, as the report ex explains, the, the, the purpose is to seek your approval to a new policy to guide the allocation of funding to foster carers for um, adaptations to property. Um, and as the report and the policy explain, this is enab to enable us to um, help foster carers have children with them where that really is the, the best placement for them and in their long-term interests and the only obstacle is that they they don't have uh, exactly what they need in terms of the the property and an investment um, supported by us would help there at the moment as the report explains we have a, uh, a budget and requirements are looked at on an ad hoc basis and there's no formal criteria against which they're judged. So this is really to tidy things up and to give us that formal set of criteria and expectations uh, against which to take decisions. It sets out um, some permissions for decisions to be taken uh, up to a certain value uh, by uh, the, the, the lead member and others to, to require the Section 151 officer agreement. Alison, uh, just to recap, um, obviously in the briefing we've seen this one and uh, I just reiterate for public consumption some of the, the points made, which is this is a finite pot currently and we will look to replenish it it's, if we can through other sorts of funding. But the finite pot, um, we were to sort of say what is the run rate and because it was ad hoc and uh, currently the pot hadn't been used uh, substantively uh, we were uh, happy that the, we couldn't really equate a run rate to how long the pot would last and each decision would be made on, it, on its way simply because it is a pot and it is what it is and um, I'm happy with the thresholds discussed there um, and I'm also happy with the fact that we said we would be looking uh, into the future to see how else we could bring something else to the pot. Questions? 
Chair, I'm very happy with this. I think it's another way in which we can demonstrate that our policies with um, children who need our support and help looked after children particularly are truly child focused and that we can make decisions in the interests of the child um, and uh, you know th there aren't going to be that many people coming for this and it's just, it's really important that we're able to offer them that flexibility of making adaptations because sometimes children with particular disabilities are those that otherwise would be most difficult to place so I think it's uh, it's really good. Sure. Um, I, I had one or two questions about this. I, obviously, it's, it's a, an excellent idea, and it's very good that the city has this opportunity to help foster carers um, adapt their homes to accommodate more children. Um, it was more around the question of, so why now is the policy coming in as opposed to, because obviously 2015, when the funding awarded, we spent more than half of it. Um, what is the need that sort of prompted the policy? I, I'll give you this straight and honest answer for that. Um, Re relatively recently, uh, the Director of Housing allocated to, to us a named um, business lead within the Directorate, Alison Cloutman, who came along, looked at what we were doing and realised that there was no policy and said this needs to be tidied up and we need a policy. So it is literally somebody with a pair of eyes on this thinking actually you know, it's not really sufficient to be taking decisions ad hoc, let's have a policy framework around this. It wasn't a difficult policy framework to put together um, and it's a useful you know, clarification of how we do business but it was literally you know, the, the, the new pair of eyes looking at this. Sure. Um, in terms of changes it made from the way you behaved ad hoc, um, one or two things to me jumped out as possible shifts. Um, moving away from getting three quotes for work to be done, moving to an in-house builder predominantly, but perhaps these were taking place anyway. I'm just wondering if the policy has actually changed those things or if, um, if, if that was something that was kind of the practice anyway. Um, so in terms of where I was looking in the policy for that information, um I should say um, I'm slightly at a disadvantage because I haven't got my housing colleague with me, but right, um, yeah. the, the policy establishes that the responsibility for getting this work done would be with the um, housing directorate, but they would decide whether or not this was an in-house project or something for which they would uh, secure tenders and um, uh, as my understanding is that this is just talking about them having oversight of the process. Okay, because in the report 4.4 it says it removes the need for three quotes for the work. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly where the, the point about it being using an in-house but my main, my main concern was really to make sure that this is more financially efficient with the remaining money, which obviously is not that enormous a pot anymore, rather than um, taking any risk that the individual modifications might cost more. The, the policy, mm -hmm. I, I presume, is likely to be more rigorous in terms of how money is spent, rather than there being any risk of it um, actually too, keeping the money too much in-house and not getting the best value. I think certainly um, the way things are at the moment, um, with everything look, being looked at very, very carefully indeed, um, it's most unlikely that decisions now would be more lax than, uh, or you know, not not be so um, carefully taken as as in the past. Um, but but I acknowledge, obviously, it, it, the report does say that it would remove the need for three quotes. So there 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 is a change here. Um, I think it would be perhaps useful just to log that the the committee. Um, is anxious to main ensure that the best value for money continues to be secured under this policy, um, under the minutes. Yeah. One final question on that point then. Are we undertaking, because obviously this was a static pot that we received for a period of years, are we undertaking some review of how effective the, the outcomes have been? So have, have the places been created, have they been maintained? Um, has this money, you know, served to create extra foster places or allowed foster children with, with more challenging needs to find more stable, better placement? The allocations that have been made to date have been made with that in, in view. Um, and I'm, I'm not actually aware at the moment of any monitoring report that I can immediately bring to your attention on that. Um, but I'm sure we could do that uh, because there's... Uh, has been noted these cases are relatively few in number. 
uh, I think again it's it would be a useful addition to to note that it would be appropriate on an annual basis to uh, to look at how this, the money has been used and and what our view is of its effectiveness in terms of being child focused as Councillor Smythe says. Absolutely and just in terms of applying for funding in the future if we can show tangible results obviously that would be helpful I imagine. Thank you. Indeed, Chair, the policy requires uh, each request to be subject to financial appraisal and only pro progress if the capital costs can be offset by equivalent revenue savings or costs avoided over the following three years, which can be enormous in these cases because it can mean a child not being able to be in an ordinary family setting. Um, and so that information is readily there if we want to, uh, if, it, if it needs to be monitored on a, on a, on a, a reasonable basis. Absolutely. I understood that as the assessment in advance. I was asking more about whether or not it was then checked up on that it, it then occurred. Yeah, and, and an annual retrospective report would do that for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, colleagues. Um, yeah. Okay, colleagues, uh, shall I move, move on to that? Thank you very much for both your inputs. Very useful and um, in a way it followed where I started with we best started with a bit of rigorous view about it and then realized obviously there's a there's another aspect of that we were quite lucky to have this fund to help out families and it's it, obviously because it's very rarely used it tends to be the most pressing cases anyway so in a roundabout way it, its own feedback source the most appropriate person to who got this uh, this, this funding. Right, I'm going to move on to the recommendations while my colleagues look for the small print. <laughs> okay. And the, the recommendation one is uh, approves the policy to provide financial support to foster carers who meet the requirements as laid out in the policy at Appendix A, which I do. Point two, gives delegated authority to the Director of Children and Families and Education to approve individual business cases. The S-151 officer has already detailed delegated authority to finance managers to approve capital spend up to the maximum of 50000 and approves the financial assistance agreement at Appendix B. I'm happy to approve those. Okay. Okay, then... Uh, then there's a blank. So we reached the end of this meeting. Okay. <laughs> all right. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, thank you all. Okay. All right.